Holy cow, you guys. Our guest today is so incredible. I loved this episode. I honestly, like, I felt like I just got lost in, like, the moment completely. Uh, my, my guest is Joyce Anastasia. Holy cow. So she, she opens up the episode by talking about um, some of the, honestly, uh, psychic type experiences that she had as a kid and then goes into wow, like, honestly, I'm, I'm amazed how well she's able to share these stories, but these near-death experiences that she had, which, you know, are very traumatic, um, but she does such a beautiful job of teaching what she learned from those experiences um, and how she has um, turned that into her life's work. It's, it's so good. She's, she's just a beautiful, beautiful soul. Um, she has a book called Extraordinary Leadership Dur During Extraordinary Times, The Seven Vital Keys That Inspire Transformation from the Inside Out. And she freaking gets it. She has a company called Lead by Wisdom, where she helps entrepreneurs and conscious leaders identify their greatest visions, insights, and divine gifts, and to learn the most effective tools to navigate their challenges and leverage their most significant heart-based manifestations, she puts it. So she's all about, let's not just only make mental decisions, let's, let's include our heart and our soul in these decisions. She is awesome. 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 Just, I couldn't love her more. So um, I know you guys are in for a treat. Get ready back. Here is Joyce Anastasia. Before we get in the show, I wanted to make sure that you guys knew about two awesome things that I have going on right now in my company. The first is my next hire retreat, which is going to be in Maui, Hawaii. This is May 10th through 14th. Please check it out at taragarrison.com slash retreat, and it will redirect you to that page. This is going to be focused all on physical health. So my retreats from now on will be focused on one of our four peaks of hire, which are personal, physical, professional, and people, which are like the four key areas of life that we focus on. And this retreat is all focused on physical. So we're doing a biohacking buffet, a biomechanics class, the mindsets behind physical transformation you might be missing. We're also doing health the way I feel like it should be done. And that is having fun, playing outside, hanging out with cool people. We're going to be surfing, spending some time at the beach, hula dancing, so many amazing things. So if you want to check that out again, it's taragarrison.com slash retreats. And, um, the other thing is a new coaching offer that I have. I'm very excited about this. This is my path to being able to help more people. And so I have offered a group coaching form of higher coaching. What that involves is a private coaching community, a group coaching call with me once a week. And you also get access to my coach Tara app included in this and access to every single program that I have ever released all in a vault for my higher coaching clients. So very excited about that. It is only $297 a month. So significantly discounted from my private coaching. So if that's interesting to you, please check it out at taragarrison.com. You'll just see it right there on my homepage, or you can go directly to the taragarrison.com slash higher dash coaching. All right, let's go ahead and get into the show. Okay. So Joyce talking before the show started, we talked about your very first company that you launched was called second sight. And it was an intuitive consultancy offering psychic readings. And you said you were about 19 or 20 when you started that, correct? Yeah. And then you developed your next company, Soul Prince, which was a psychotherapeutic counseling practice that combined um, co concrete, practical, and creative spiritual work, which still exists, Soul Prince, which is very cool. I know my audience is already like, oh, I know Tara's digging this stuff because I, you know, as I mentioned to you, I love the combination. It's not, it's not a combination to me. It's the same thing of being in touch with that intuitive knowledge from source and understanding that we have this extra gift to bring to the table with our practical lives, right? Like, it's like, let's add, let's not miss out on some of the resources that we have and making our lives better. And in, now you have lead by wisdom, which when I read what this was, I was like, oh my gosh, yes, please. Oh my goodness. Like it's so helping leaders, um, recognizing that leadership was kind of focused only on the mind and you're saying, eh, let's bring in heart and soul into our leadership. And so that's what lead by wisdom is all about. Um, and then you also have your book, extraordinary leadership during extraordinary times, which you wrote before the whole shutdown stuff, which is obviously very, <laughs> uh, sounds an alignment for you. Um, the seven vital keys that inspire transformation from the inside out. And so I definitely want to talk about some of those keys today, but you know, I, I share all that first, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about like 
your personal story just a little bit. We don't have to spend a lot of time on it. You know, just from a young age, uh, being able to intuitively know things that, you know, you got in touch with that side and then having near death experiences. And like, can you give us a little context for what you've learned in your life that brought you into these places? Absolutely. Uh, and I'll also give a context of my family background that might help uh, to inform all this. My dad uh, was an engineer, is an engineer, and he's now no longer working. He's um, in an Alzheimer's facility, actually. And this uh, kind of also informs what I do now. So my my dad had a very logical mind, very, very logical mind. And my grandparents on both my mom and dad's side were very intuitive, but very practical. Anyone who has traveled across the ocean to come to Ellis Island to be here in America to, to make a new life has to have that fortitude. So I grew up with this incredible sense of no matter what is happening outside of us, we can live our lives with some semblance of joy and appreciation for what we have, using all the tools of ourselves to do so. Mm. So at a very young age, I knew that I I couldn't necessarily rely on other people to be available coming from a big family. So I had developed at a very young age, a connection with source, a connection with spirit that was not necessarily imposed on me by religion or anyone else's spirituality, but just a deep listening as a little, as a little girl. And so very early on, when I was about five years old, I had an experience at a playground where a classmate of mine was on the uneven parallel bars. And I saw a vision in front of my, my own mind screen that if this young friend of mine did not pay attention, he, he might get hurt. And the vision was him falling off the uneven parallel bars and, and hitting the ground on his head and presumably dying. So I went up to him, you know, very, I was pretty shy, but I felt like I had to help this young friend of mine. So I told him this and he, he was a little annoyed and a little upset and a teacher on the playground overheard it. And she was very angry with me. And she started yelling at me, don't you ever dare do that. Two weeks later, the actual event happened and this little boy passed away. Oh and it was so disturbing to me in, on so many levels that I wasn't sure how to process it. On top of being yelled at by the outdoor teacher, um, she did not want me to come near to help. And of course, you know, it's a huge emergency of you know, the emergency people coming and this, wow. my classmate is dead. At the same time, this teacher was telling me stay away. And in fact, telling other kids that it might've been caused by me, <sighs> which as you know, a five-year-old, how do you so, process that? So you know, traumatic on, it's so confusing on so many levels. Very confusing. Yes. However, even with all of that, because I um, had this <laughs> internal communication, excuse me, I had this internal communication with source, what, where, from whence we came, I was assured and and comforted mm. by, I, I would say it felt like angelic mm -hmm. beings hugging me, my grandparents coming in and hugging me and saying, it's okay. And that it will be okay. Mm. And so instead of tamping it down, mm. 
I, I, I didn't shut it down. Awesome. And continued to use it as traumatic as that was. Wow. Beautiful. I definitely, I mean, uh, depending on how long someone has known me or particular my things that, you know, it might've picked up bit, bits and pieces, but I've, I've had so many experiences in which I feel that like angelic support, like we're with you, we're, we're with you every second. We're always here, always here. Don't worry. You know? <laughs> and I, I, and, and, and just random times of feeling it like that. So I know what you're talking about and it's, it's, um, I think when you have that kind of spiritual connection, uh, to something that you can't see, but you know, like you just know it, it, there's a sense of confidence that you carry in the world of not really caring so much about like the teacher, the outdoor teacher, like the, 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 I'm using her figuratively in the world, like a uh, people it's like, it kind of doesn't hold a lot of weight because you know, uh, the strength of the, I guess, information that you're receiving. And you can just tell there's a different frequency to it, you know? And so as you went on and I know, you know, I don't want to spend a ton of time because I really want to get into how you're helping leaders, like bring their soul and their heart into their decision-making, but you know, you had near death experiences, which to me, wow, that's, uh, I, I, there was some, I don't watch a lot of, you know, stuff. I don't watch a lot of, I, I hate TV and movies. Actually, it's very, very rare, but for some reason I saw a near death experience, uh, show on Netflix and I just watched the first episode. And for me, I was like, you know, I use plant medicines personally as a way to tap in deeper to source. And I was like, these are plant medicine experiences. Like they, they <laughs> very similar, very similar, you know? And so can you share uh, just a little bit on that and how, I guess what you've learned, what the, the, the nuggets that you've taken with you that are now helping you propel the work that you're doing out in the world. Absolutely. Uh, Tara, you know, you've said on a number of your podcasts, how each of us go through our own uh, dark nights of the soul. Let me just put it that way and challenges in our life. And I I've had many difficult times in my life. But I have always learned that by that we have the strength from within to move forward. If we get off track, we'll be guided in another direction. Mm -hmm. So I was in a place in a couple of my near-death experiences, and I'm just going to share the last one. So the first two were when I was young, and it was much more of a support to help me understand that what I was experiencing was uh, not a punishment to mm. me, but that I came into it so I could learn mm. other ways to tap into the gifts as human beings that we have. Wow. So after the um, my seven to eight year old experience where I was flipped up in a riptide and and knocked unconscious and left my body the the follow-up to that after a beautiful experience and I was told I had to come back it was you know I I couldn't stay there was that my dyslexia that was making it really challenging for me to learn at school uh reversed itself I was able to read. I was wow. also in, in the first book that I read fully after that, after, you know, three inch letters that I had to have in order to read properly. Mm -hmm. I was in third grade reading first grade readers. I was uh, introduced to the, an Edgar Casey book. And here I was kind of sneaking it off into my bedroom when I could barely read weeks before wow. reading the whole thing in three nights. Awesome. And there were, were two gifts from that. One was that, wow, whatever I experience from that two by four across the head, like pay attention to what is in front of you in your physical realm. Like, it's really easy for us to get in an accident and die in this life. 
So it's a privilege to be alive. It's a privilege to have a sacred body in which to have our souls express itself, right? Mm -hmm. So the second thing from that near-death experience with the Edgar Casey reading afterward was I recognized that here is someone who lived a life like I was living and I was being criticized for these intuitive gifts as fantasy mm -hmm. versus as what I was being shown from the unseen realms. Mm -hmm. And it allowed me to take it in even more and say, I'm going to embrace this and I'm going to find ways in this physical life mm -hmm. as to how to develop them and help mm -hmm. others to do so too. Mm -hmm. So that, that was that. And then the third near death experience was very traumatic. I had uh, been through a divorce. My dad was diagnosed with cancer. I decided, um, I lost my position because they lost their funding. I moved from Florida to New York to help my dad and mom uh, with him through his cancer. And I took a job that I probably shouldn't because it paid half of what was really sustainable, teaching. I went there. I was asked to date my boss, the person who hired me for days and days on end. And so I was not in alignment. In that. <laughs> I was totally dismantled. Yes. Not in dynamic balance, which is one of my chapters of my book. I was completely disconnected from myself. Yeah. And so when I finally said, yes, I was chapter one, I was powering over myself. So. Mm my first chapter of my book is called consciously choosing power with versus power over. Mm. And I mean that not only on an individual basis, but on a global basis, mm. like, wow. are we going to continue to have these warring events when, where does it get us? It gets mm. us death, suffering, pain, sorrow, right? Right. right. How does that help our world? <laughs> please tell me, you know, right. it really doesn't just like with ourselves. So mm -hmm. here I was powering over myself, making a choice to date a man I didn't want to date and moving beyond that to the near death experience. My third one was he started strangling me because I didn't want to date him anymore. Essentially wow. Wow. there were a lot more details, but that's the essential rationale. And I went into a, the deepest of my near-death experiences. And as you say, plant medicine often evokes those kind of death and rebirth energetics. Mm -hmm. But this was real, um, yeah. really being um, almost killed. Yes. And immediately when I left my body, I was comforted again, this whole comforting experience of angels coming, ancestors coming, master teachers appearing, and giving me lessons of, I'll say this essentially, we are way more than our bodies, <laughs> right? And that if we can move beyond the fear of death, then we can say, I want to live. Yeah. And I want to share all mm -hmm. that I have been gifted with in this lifetime on this planet. And so I had a choice at the end of the near death experience either stay or leave. I could have mm -hmm. stayed in that amazing, peaceful, exuberant place of learning where the master teacher said, would you like to understand the, the fabric of the universe? And I was, and of course, Tara, it, in near-death experiences, it's literally seconds of time. This man is still strangling me, but it feels like 20 years. 
wow. of learning and experiencing and mm. being gifted with wisdom and support wow. and compassion, right? The other learning from that near-death experience that is absolutely, absolutely stimulated the writing of my book was this notion of looking back on my life in the near-death experience, shown a blank book going backward in time. They wanted me to see all the ways in which I had helped people and mm -hmm. been compassionate with people and had and contributed in, mm -hmm. in the ways that I had hoped to in mm -hmm. service to humanity and the, and the world, right? So I'm in tears watching, looking, looking at this going, thank you for showing me mm -hmm. that, that I did do these beautiful things that I wish to do on this planet. Those that were conscious and things that I said and did that I was totally unconscious of mm -hmm. that made a difference for people mm -hmm. in their lives, right? Beautiful. And then being asked, okay, now we want you to go back and see ways that you might have harmed people. Wow. Now, I, I never want to harm people consciously, mm -hmm. but of course we do unconsciously or subconsciously by things we think or do or mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. And when we are out of balance, we do things that might unconsciously or subconsciously hurt people mm. so those were my my deepest learnings mm. and and how to bring that to people like not blaming self but right. learning from and being responsible for the life we're choosing to live mm. that is the crux of of leadership Wow. That's the most uh, beautiful uh, story and example of the concept of extreme ownership that I've ever heard, because it's in such a honoring, honoring way, recognizing, you know, I used to hear we're all connected, we're all one. And I'm like, yeah, I didn't really know what that meant until I had for me personally, a psychedelic journey in which I literally was everything. I, I was, there was no emotion. There were no thoughts. There were no, there was no need for any of that. It was just a pure, like, yes, <laughs> is the only word I know how to describe it. And I came back out of that. I, I, I think because of some of my, even though I, mine were uh, artificially <laughs> artificial simulations, um, uh, it did, it did also rid me of the fear of death. I'm, I'm not afraid to die. I'm actually quite curious what happens on the other side, but because of that, I, it, it, when you want to be here, when you, when you, when you know that this is not really it, but you see the beauty and the value of the experience of being here, it just, it's, it's, it's exciting and it changes you and how you show up. You know, I think you're, what I'm hearing from you is you don't have to be here. You had a choice. You don't have to be here. And when you're choosing, when you know you're choosing to be here, I mean, it's like roll up your sleeves, let's get to work, let's go, let's enjoy, let's eat that delicious food, let's have that incredible experience, let's reach out to that person, let's let's evolve my own soul and see. I, I love this. I love how you were taught it's so beautiful of see yourself, see yourself, see yourself, see yourself. Okay, now that you're we're good and clear on that, let's let's look at some of the unconscious behaviors. And I, that is such an amazing segue to the leadership coaching that you're doing now, right? Because I feel like that's exactly what it is when we're out of alignment and we, you know, lose our cool or we judge or, you know, just some of these lower vibrational shame, uh, guilt, you know, energies that are coming out of us. We don't even realize selfishness, self-preservation. It's all about me. You know, we see this happen in leadership and I'm very excited to hear your thoughts because I have found for me in business, Sometimes it's, um, it's been an interesting to, to observe as a, as like an observer of life. I'm like, I know that looks shiny and cool that they have all those things and they've reached this certain level of success, but I, now I'm seeing some slimy energy underneath that. And like, no, like I don't, 
that's not success to me. That's, that's wounded behavior, honestly, probably <laughs> trying to prove your worth and your value at all costs and stampeding over people. So I'm excited to hear your thoughts of how you are helping bring in the heart and the soul, the other two huge pieces of decision-making in addition to the mind, into the mind, into the, the, into the psyches, into the souls of leaders. Okay, I'm going to start out by uh, helping your audience know that when I was allowed to come back, I was still being strangled, right? Oh, man. So before I, I left, I said, okay, I, I, I decided I, I have work to do. I still have work to do. I really want to go back. Um, but can you help me out here? <laughs> because I'm still being strangled, right? Yeah. So they gave me specific instructions on what to do. Wow. And how to re, re this man was six foot two. So so and I, if you guys aren't watching on video, I don't you're you're a very small woman. <laughs> I mean I thought, beautiful, beautiful, but you're definitely not six two, you know. I'm, I'm five foot one, yeah, uh, about 95 pounds, <laughs> and uh, he was six foot two. Uh, 280 pounds. He was oh a sculptor. Goodness. I was a sculptor too, but he was a sculptor. Oh my goodness. And um, so his hands around my neck were sculptor hands. And, and um, I was told, put your hands around on top of his hands. We're going to put ours around yours and you're going to pry his hands off you. Wow. Take your purse with your ID and you're going to run. And and I was safe and it, it all wow. worked out. Wow. Now, I say this because having a near-death experience for me bridged between the spiritual to the concrete world of our physicality. We're in a gravitational world where when we get cut, we bleed. When we're being strangled, we could die. So it was it was this kind of brilliant uh, experience of, of that bridge. Yeah. And so this is in part what I help to teach leaders about. One other piece I'll say, and then I'll get into more of what I do with leaders. When I was in that space with the master teachers, they showed me all my past lives and how they might be impacting me. Wow. Things that might carry karma from one lifetime to the next. I was clearly told that this was not a karmic debt for me. This was a choice on his part to do what he did. However, they also showed me a past life that we were together, this man and I, it was in France, and I was his executioner. I was a male and I was his executioner. I had black veil over my head during the time of the guillotine. I had no idea who he was, what he did. So it, it was another lesson for me to say, do not blindly take jobs where you become unconscious of the actions that you do. Wow. You see, uh, yeah, it's not, it wasn't to blame me. Mm -hmm. It was to bring my awareness, to raise my awareness to a place of this man was not killing me as a, as a karmic thing to that. But they showed me how that could impact what I choose in this lifetime. Mm -hmm to be conscious of what I am choosing, to don't, not to do it out of fear. So this is one of the teachings with the leaders that I work with, the people that I work with, and we're all leaders, just to, to put that into perspective, mm -hmm. Tara. <laughs> I, I work with people who are recognized as leaders and those who are not. Yeah. I work with super soldiers, those who have been asked to do things against their own will, against mm. their own bodies. Mm. I've worked with whistleblowers who have um, taken the courage to express 
the truth. But when you do that, um, there's a barrage of external things that quote unquote, feel as if your life is being destroyed. No, it's not. <laughs> what the illusion of was a life that you thought was successful mm. to a life where you bring, you know, this incredibly powerful impact in the world when you could be in alignment with your own truth. Mm. It's the hardest thing to do. Mm. So when when I work with leaders who, well, first I'll just say this. When people come to me, it's almost always word of, word of mouth. I don't do a lot of advertising because my work is so confidential. Mm. Like people who come to me don't want it to be splashed out right in the world <laughs> yes. um however there are some who who do and and that's fine and it's with permission if they mm -hmm. want to and i'm i'm open to that too mm -hmm. but this word of mouth um people who refer people to me know that that i'm very unique in how i work with people mm -hmm. it's very customized to where a person is at i insist and I'll, I'll joke about this i'll say to people if you lie to me i will know it yeah. and, and you're welcome to but i'm going to see through it eventually i'm going to get to saying to you okay now tell me the real story you know yeah. um and it's it's not that it's not an ego thing like i'm not saying that like i'm yeah to your body or your soul but right. I, with permission from your soul only, mm -hmm. the people who I work with, I wouldn't be able to see it if their soul didn't want me to see it. Mm -hmm. Their soul wants me to see it because mm -hmm. they've been lying to themselves. Mm -hmm. Just like I was mm -hmm. when I started dating this man. Like, do I really want to date? No, I really don't want to date this man. <laughs> Why am I powering over myself to date this man? Because I was afraid of losing my job right yep. fear yep fear so helping people to build up practices mm -hmm. and daily expressions that build their confidence their courage to be truthful to themselves to unveil their disconnect between why am I doing this? Their motivation mm -hmm. and what they really want to contribute in this world. And it's usually a gigantic disconnect. If they're in a job they hate, they could be a CEO of a major company that gets accolades every single week. Mm -hmm. They hate their job. Like that's not healthy. What would you say, you know, if somebody's listening to this right now and they, they know, they know they're out of alignment somewhere. They know it's maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's in regards to like an addiction that they're hiding and shameful about, or, you know, they hate their job. Like you just said, or they just know there's something it's like, yeah, yep. <laughs> you know, what, what would you tell them to encourage them to take a look at in order to like really start to address it and then you know pause i know it's general but do you have some principles of common things that you see that cause people to stay in these places of misalignment with themselves and how do you start to maneuver them back into their their alignment with their higher self so i'll just give you a, a extreme example let's talk about um people who get into mafias okay they they may, let's say they're trying to help their parents mm -hmm. and they don't have the money and their parents need the money in order to survive. And so somebody finds out, oh, maybe he or she is willing to do anything to bring money into the family. And so they, they do a little lie. They do a little thing out of alignment. And then it grows and grows and grows. And then mm -hmm. 10 years later, they, they, they can't believe mm -hmm. what they're doing. 
in their lives as actions. Well, let's take that on a small level. Let's take um, a boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, someone you, you find yourself in a relationship that you know is unhealthy and um, it's really hard to break away. Well, I ask people to, to really reflect on if you were to speak to a child who is being abused, what would you do for them or tell them? What would you encourage them to, to experience? And it might be anything from um, gentle care, gentle caresses, to getting having an adult remove them from a situation, they too, the person who has experienced this, might need support. So reach out for support to remove oneself from an abusive relationship or Mm. an abusive situation until there is a chance to process through why is this happening and why did I choose this? Mm -hmm. Why am I choosing to stay in this relationship? Mm -hmm. And I, I find it's very commonly uh, extremely consistent pattern with childhood experiences. And I love that example of asking for help, you know, like you wouldn't expect a, a kid to get themselves out of that situation. And when you're operating from the wounded inner child, you really are just a kid that needs help. And I, I, I was in a very unhealthy relationship after my divorce and I didn't have anybody. I was like completely socially isolated. Right. And that's, that kept me in there so much longer because you start to question yourself. Right. And uh, course, as I went through a big healing journey, I found, oh, how did you feel as a kid when you were being abused alone all by myself? There's no one here to help me. Right. So that wounded inner child was just repeating those same beliefs, you know, and now I don't play that game anymore. As soon as something feels weird in one of my dating relationships, I talk to my friends and I'm like, is this weird? They're like, yep, that's weird. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> so <laughs> I that's, love that advice. That's fantastic. And then on, on another end of the spectrum, if people have been bullied, and this has happened more with men than women, but it happens with both and all people, that people get bullied when they're, when they're young. And it sets up a dynamic around power that is really uncomfortable and unnatural. So I invite people to sit with, what does power mean to you? Hmm. It's not inherently bad or good. It's what you do with it. We are inherently born with the capacity to express power. Hmm. It's part of being alive, hmm. right? So what are we going to do with our power? As a kid, when I would witness my dad, who grew up in a horribly abusive scenario from his father, uh, he carried on some of those abusive tendencies. I was very fortunate that it wasn't excessive, but it was enough where when he was trying to discipline my brothers as a little girl, I felt like, oh my goodness, I can't even, if, if I try to intervene, my dad is going to kill me. Mm -hmm. Or if I don't, my dad is going to kill my brothers. Mm. This is the way it, ch children process mm -hmm. things, yes. right? Yes. Even though it wasn't that extreme, but I'm sharing that as that's mm -hmm. what was going on in my little head. Mm -hmm. And so my relationship to power became, I was afraid of my power. Right. Because at that very young age, I think I was around four years old, when I couldn't stop my dad from hitting my brothers and afraid they were going to get hurt really badly, mm -hmm. I felt helpless. Totally. I felt like, oh my goodness. So, 
And then my mind went to, I need to do something. Right. And then when I thought about it a little bit, I thought I could actually kill my father if if I am going to protect my brothers this is at four years old. Right, right. The right. little tiny girl that I was, right? right? Right. So I, in that moment in time, at four or five years old, said, I have to be really careful not to take on too much power. Mm. Because if I do, I could hurt someone. Right. Do you right. see how that totally. And so then just think about this years later, when I was in that position where I was vulnerable, out of balance, and I felt like I, I needed not to use my power to say no, right. Dating that man. Right. You see, I powered over myself. Crazy. Wow. Now, young boys and men do that too. And how it shows up sometime is this extreme of I'm better than you Mm. so in a work environment rather than it being a powering with becomes a powering over even on at an unconscious level Mm -hmm. so the word competitive which has been distorted to mean you know I'm better Mm. than you I need to be the top of the hill Mm. Actually, the core original word of compete means to strive together for. <laughs> really? Yes. Wow. How distorted did yes. we bring that beautiful word from its origins? And it actually relates. I think of you as the athletic person that you are. Um it happened in Olympics. So many, many eons ago in Greece, what are those about? They were striving together for to be excelling Mm -hmm. on their own, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Almost um, strive together for yourself to be even more Uh, I don't want to use the word successful, but um, seeing yeah. your potential yes. <laughs> yeah. right through the the right the last barrier, the perceived limitations you have on yourself, and the the competition serves as a place to be able to show what what you've broken through, you know, That's versus right. I'm going to crush you and destroy you because I'm better than you. <laughs> That's right, right. And when when that happens. And when there is this notion of uh, great sportsmanship, it's the same thing in the work realm. Mm. If you have right. people who are honoring each other for the accomplish- accomplishments, for the goals of the company, just because you are infusing intuition and heartfelt energetics, That doesn't mean that you let go of, we have a deadline and a goal, right? Right. It doesn't mean that at all. You can do it together. And what better way to that whole uh, fairy tale of whistle while you work, (laughs) real being playful instead of feeling like I'm suffering to get this work done my boss is making me work 18 hours a day so I reach a deadline and who's going to get the star you know bonus year no when people work together collaboratively in that power with with truth transparency honoring truth and transparency my second chapter and integrity not having to, you know, the priorities are this and it's not unethical. Yeah, right. Then amazing things can happen. Yes, this is, this is, oh, I, 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 
forgive me, men, forgive me, men, but I do find this kind of mindset a lot with women in the workplace, at least in my experience, you know, uh, uh, it's just a, it's so enjoyable. I hope there's a lot of men out there like that. Actually, I do know a lot of men like that. You know, these are kind of, these are the people that I surround myself with professionally, the ones that truly, they're not just saying it. You can tell by the way they show up and the, the nuanced little actions they have and their reactions to things that they truly, really genuinely earnestly like almost desperately just really want everyone around them to win you know and it's like once you're on that frequency then you attract a lot of people on that frequency you know and when people aren't on that frequency you kind of like it just doesn't resonate you know and so it is you're exactly right. I can't tell you how many high performers I've met that I know there's people out there that are tricking people and conning people and it's scarcity and, you know, proving my worth and all that stuff. I know that exists, but the more I focus on staying in alignment myself and staying in high integrity myself, I just, you just, you start to see how many other people are operating on that level. So I love what you're saying. It's not, this is not using your heart and your gut is not a low performance. It is a high performance, um, uh, approach to business. For sure, you know, and even, you know, I, I can't tell you how many books I've read, like uh, Principles by Ray Dalio, billionaire, you know, talks about like meditation, transcendental meditation, attributing a lot of his success to that. Uh, I read uh, 11 Rings by Phil Jackson talking about how he got made fun of back in the day with the Bulls because they meditated and they were one heart, one mind, you know, a lot what you're talking about here. So yes, these are beautiful high performance mentalities. And I'm grateful that you're holding space. Um, I, 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 I'm like sitting here, I'm like, I bet your coaching is so good because you're helping people to see, uh, what, why they're like locked into these, uh, perceptions that are causing fear or scarcity or, um, unnecessary suffering around what's happening in the world around them. And you're saying, Hey, step into yourself, safe, step into yourself, step into yourself. Okay. Once, you know, and that's a lot of the work that I do as well. It's like, once you have you, if you're feeling lonely and alone and isolated, it's because you've abandoned yourself. That's it. Yes. You know, <laughs> uh, absolutely a parallel to one of the keys in, in the chapters of my book, uh, dissolving on healthy separation mm, honoring so uniqueness mm. honoring uniqueness so I love it you know the the whole notion of it's not woo woo to love it's not woo woo to feel unity but this is with the notion of we do not spiritually bypass either we're mm. not you know, separating into meditation and not bringing it back into, into right. the everyday world. So I, I do this um, shared governance practice that in a group. So I do individual where mm -hmm. we could do past life regressions. We could mm -hmm. do tapping into those things that are blocking where Mm -hmm. where the challenges are in people's lives. We could look into pathways for the future without saying, this is what you're going to do mm -hmm. because no one can tell you your mm -hmm. future. Mm -hmm. you, but what I am shown is what are the greatest, most lit up possibilities of your greatest potential? Mm -hmm. And where can you go up on a pathway that might lead to a lot of challenges? And then you have a choice. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. can choose those if you want to. Maybe you'll learn something from them. But here are the mm. pathways that are going to bring mm. the most expressed potential of your beingness. Beautiful. And you might want to go. Wow. What a beautiful gift. I just have to say, you know, that's definitely, I, I did grow up in a religious environment. So everything was black and white and right or wrong. And it was very paralyzing for me a lot in my life on decision-making because it was, is this the right or the wrong decision? Is this the right path for my life or the wrong path for my life? Right. So that's very uh, paralyzing 
if every decision is right or wrong. It's like, oh my gosh, it's a 50 50 gamble here, you know? And so for me, one of the things that I've just learned over and over, and I really truly, I've had like my guides have had to like intervene. And it's like, hey, it's just up to you, baby. You can choose whatever you choose, you know, but pay attention to how you you're feeling. And, you, and if you're not, if it's not feeling in alignment, you can just shift. You're not stuck in that path. Like you can just come back over here, just pay attention to how you're feeling as a result of that choice, but there's no right or wrong. It's all learning. It's just some of those, if, if we ignore how we're feeling and we're abandoning ourselves and we're just, you know, in scarcity and fear, but like, it's just going to get harder and harder and harder and harder. And then if we, if we pay attention to that and be like, okay, I'm going to have boundaries. I'm going to show up for me. I'm going to show up for my inner child and say, no, and I'm going to go this way. Oh, it's what you're talking about. It's like, there's some, some paths you can go where it's like, yay, I like this one. Yeah. <laughs> so and so resonate. And there are a million micro decisions in between. Mm. And yeah, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. One of my uh, clients is in her 30s. She's starting on a new career. She is uh, in the midst of, she thought she was going to live in one place uh, with her partner and things came up and it's going to be dead of winter and very hard because they can't live there. She had she thought she had two choices. Mm. And what came up was that, well, what if you say, I'm temporarily going to leave here and I want to come back. Can we have first dibs on coming back when it's ready? You yeah. see, right. There's, There's more choices often, way more, <laughs> infinitely more. <Right. laughs> and yeah. um, the other piece is, and, and this is a very, very important piece for people, especially in business where they get stuck in the, in the thing like um, they know, have to know it all. They have to know mm -hmm. everything. Well, mm -hmm. no, um, we don't. And we don't see all the big picture. It's great to have wisdom around experience and knowledge combined. But if we can all keep an open mind, be of a curious mindset, then we can start to see things where possibilities allow for miraculous gifts to come in. Mm -hmm. Truly, mm. where we begin to, to use other tools to guide us mm -hmm. in decision making. Mm -hmm. I often say to people who are so left brain, and it's great to be left brain, I'm talking here about integrating our logic left brain, logical left brain, concrete, planning step by step, so important in living our lives here, but in combination with intuition mm -hmm. is, is our magic formula. It's yes. what we were born to express. And some people will express more intuitively. Some people will express more logically, but you can't throw away either without right. living a healthy life on this planet. Mm -hmm. mm. And what you just said about uh, being open-minded and not knowing everything. I, I, I have lived in this lifetime, like a complete and total polar opposite of that. Because I, when I was religious, I knew I had all the answers you know, and I'm not knocking on religion. I'm just saying from my experience, this is what I experienced. I experienced living in a psyche in which I, I just know how it works. It works like this and this and this and this and this. And in that reality, I was extremely closed-minded. Anything that challenged that belief system was wrong. And when I came, found out that I was actually wrong, at least for me, that I was actually wrong, what happened, it was, I mean, it was hard for a little while, but as my life and my happiness levels got astronomically better, I made me really like being wrong. <laughs> I was like, what else am I wrong about? What else am I saying that I know all the time? And to me, that is the entire purpose of our, for, this is just my belief system, but I feel like that's the entire purpose of me being here, of us being here is, is, is to, to expand our knowledge, to learn more, to, you know, to, I, I believe personally that we do, we are all knowing beings. And so coming here and being childlike and not knowing, and because I'm like, 
I don't care what anybody says, says nobody knows what the hell is going on. Nobody knows exactly why we're here. Like they might want to, cause that makes them feel safe and secure, but nobody freaking knows. Nobody freaking knows for sure. It's all belief systems. And it's like coming into that. I embrace that. I like it. I, it's fun. It keeps us curious. It keeps us hungry. It keeps us exploring, you know? So anyway, I just love what you said there. It resonates it, extremely true to me that it's a very important part of not only, um, uh, like growth and expansion and leadership, but just happiness, you know? <laughs> yeah. And that, that was another thing I was going to say, you know, there's always going to be problems in the world and, and we will always be surprised by challenges in our life. And, you know, sometimes they come in threes, you hear that, but if we can build up a re resilience yeah. and be neutral witnesses to what happens mm. while taking action when we can in the best mm. ways possible. Wow. It, it is fabulous. Oh, and, I love how you put that. Yes. You know, and also taking in these really wonderful things like right now, while we're talking, my hummingbird feeder is being filled with four hummingbirds, oh. little hummingbird things. Now the hummingbird symbolizes joy while working. Be mm. joy while working. So this is another thing is allowing other creatures to inform us. Mm. Like sometimes I'll give it a, give a, I call it home play for people I work with. If they're having, they're stuck with something they're, they they can't figure out something. They have a problem. They don't know the resolution to, is it just, just take a week or three days, if they only have three days for this, and start to witness what things come to you from nature, mm. see if it helps to give you an answer. Beautiful. Love it. Yeah. Seeing the help all around us. I feel, I feel like that's a, a theme for your life. You know, you've been given the gift of being able to see that there's lots of support. There's a lot, there's a lot, a lot of it. And it's beautiful to see how you have been how you chose to stay here and provide that for others, and, you know, and, and the more that we all do that, the better we all become. And I love what you're saying about competition. Like it's, I've never been a competitive person. It's, it doesn't resonate with me very, I, it's, I, I want everyone to win and I'm truly happy for people. And, and I, I, if, if somebody else achieves something I'm wanting to achieve, I'm like, yes, because thanks for showing me that's possible. And I know that was really special to you because I want that too. And I get it. And I'm freaking happy for you, you know? And I think that if we stay in that energy of, um, gosh, what did you say? Neutral, observing neutrally while taking action, something along those lines. Yeah. Being, being, a neutral witness. Yeah. What is happening? Almost oh like. Oh my gosh, that's so good. You know, you know a pendulum. Yeah. You yeah. Have to pull them up at top, and then you have yes. the pendulum that swings. It's like climbing up the pendulum to the fulcrum, so the swings are not so great. So wow. it's not like, you know. Yeah. All is great and exciting and all is depressing you know like yeah. it, it becomes a chance for you to quietly more Observe. quietly take in mm. wow I could I could be peaceful even when there are storms around me mm-hmm mm -hmm. Wow, Joyce, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm like, I've got to introduce you to Catherine Dixon. I wonder if any of my friends who are listening are thinking that I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you offline. She's like a wonderful coach. Uh, my friends call her the Oracle. She's, she's wonderful. You guys would totally get along. She's changed my life. Um, but yeah, just, I just appreciate uh, the wisdom behind all the words that you're saying. You know, it, it's definitely obvious to me that there's a wealth that we, we gotta, we got a sprinkle of a, <laughs> an ocean of wisdom that's underneath there. So thank you so much. And um, guys, please check out her book, extraordinary leadership during extraordinary times, the seven vital keys that inspire transformation from the inside out. And also um, led by wisdom. How do they access led by wisdom? Your, your uh, coaching. Uh, they could actually go oh, lead by right wisdom, on the, yeah, go right on the site and okay. And write to me at joyceanastasia.com. 
Okay. And then uh, anywhere else you would like people to find you or participate in anything you have? LinkedIn is, is a good place to, to find me and show some of the things I've done with indigenous tribes and oh yeah. So cool. Okay. I'll find you on there. You know, I'll, I'll be in touch. Sorry guys. I got the inside loop. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Joyce. What a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate it. Tara, you're doing beautiful things in the world, and I so appreciate you. I honor you for, for what you're bringing in, and you have such an incredible energy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Likewise. For courage to bring your gifts forward for Thank everyone you. To, to witness. Thank you. Likewise. Bye-bye.